Hello, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R, and today um, I'm going to show you some pen and ink drawing. We're going to do a slow, a pygmy slow loris uh, for my endangered animal book. Um, I'm doing these uh, endangered animals for my um, cousin uh, Cynthia. And I've been saving them up to do as a book too, but I start out with pen and ink drawing and then do watercolor over them. So this is a pen and, um, the uh, pencil demonstration along with pen and ink. So I've got the tools down here in front of you so you can see a snapshot. Um, this is Higgins pen cleaner. I'm going to show that first because you don't really need it, but if your pen gets um, gunked up with ink after you've been using a while. It's nice to have some of this stuff. You can get um, other companies make them. I think Speedball makes them too. But it's basically it dilutes the varnish in the ink. So whereas other things, once the ink dries, it's very permanent. So this is good to have around. Um, the ink we'll be using is D letter black number four. This is a Japanese manga ink. You can get it just about anywhere online nowadays. It used to be difficult to get because only artists, manga artists in um, Japan would use it. I use the number four because it's nice and black and permanent. And when you paint watercolor over the top of it, it acts like crayon resist or basically it's waterproof. So you can paint over it or you can also use marker over the top of this because it's got varnish in it. Um, but again, that's D letter, black number four. Another good one is Speedball Calligrapher's Ink. Um, they smell it, sell it in very small containers. Actually, they sell it in a container like this. This is an old Speedball uh, Calligrapher's Ink container. Um, I'm just using D letter now just because I really, I really like this stuff. I just like the way it works. Um, I'm going to go into more with the pen and ink when we start doing the pen and ink. These are two of my favorite nibs. I'm going to be using this particular one. It's um, the uh, Cruel Quill 102, primarily because um, Cruel Quill pens uh, are easier to find. You won't find this one. This is a Gillet 109. I bought these, geez, I hate to say this, 20 years ago. I bought like 10 of them, and I still have 10 of them. Um, I'm still using two of them that I haven't had to throw away, primarily because with a good steel nib, they'll last a good long time. The problem is, is that you get this buildup of ink on them, which if you soak it in the Higgins after you've done it, or you actually use a knife blade. You can use um, when uh, an exacto knife blade like this one, and you can scrape off the, the, um, the ink off of that. Um, and then go in with it with soap and water and most of it will come off. That's one of the reasons why I used to have a pen knife. A pen knife was to either cut the goose quill if you're using uh, a goose quill for your pen. That was initially to cut the goose quill and help clean it. But then again, the reason why we have pen knives too is to clean out the back of this pen. Some The, the carbon will build up on the back of your pen. And so they would use the pen knife to help scrape that away so you can get the flow because this is this is like a um, a well for your ink and it if it's built up too much then your well basically is not deep and the flow of the ink is not as good so um, you occasionally you know when you clean your pens you need to clean that all out but if you're in the middle of working and you don't have time to stop and w wash it out and what have you uh, just a standard exacto knife blade, blade, blade scraped in there will get out most of the carbon that'll build up in your pen. But again, this this, this one's a Gillo or G Joseph G I L L O T T 109. Um, again, you can't find individual nibs like this anymore. It used to be you know, when pen and ink was still a big thing. Um, you could get them all the time at art supply stores. You still might be able to find just the nibs at an art supply store. I haven't bought one in a while because, like I said, I, I bought 10 nibs 20 years ago and I still haven't used the ones I've got. Um, this one probably, you know, it's a 20-year-old nib. Um, so they, they last a long time. 
again, because they're steel, it depends on the amount you use them. I've killed a lot of uh, crow quills in my day, so that's that particular pen. Um, I might be actually not using the crow quill. To, actually, I will be using that one today because my crow quill, I've got to replace my, this. they have very specific holders so that you have to get a crow quill holder for a crow quill pen. And you can get those at Blick. So they're, they're really good. I like them just as well as the Hunt, the Hunt, or I'm sorry, the, um, the Galot. The Galot is a little bit more flexible than the uh, crow quill. But, um, so it's, it's, it's like the thing is you'll, it, you'll see, it's got this marvelous like bluing on it. And this, the bluings come off the end of this one. Um, and this one will fit in this particular holder. Um, but the crow quill will not fit in this particular holder. You, you have to write, find the right holder for the right pen. But if you buy them online, usually they'll sell you a, a pen, a holder, and uh, Speedball sells a bottle of calligraphy ink with their, um, their crow quill. And that, that ink is absolutely fine and wonderful. It's an acrylic-based ink. And it will also, you can do watercolor over it. So, you know, use that bottle up and then get some D letter. Okay, this, um, what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to eyeball off about a half inch around on all sides. This is a, a pre-cut sheet of uh, Arches 150-pound watercolor paper. And I cut this off. I had a block of 9x12. And occasionally when I'm getting down to the bottom of my 9x12 pad, they sell it in 20 sheets. Um, the sheets will come apart. The glue doesn't work anymore. So I'll take the last few sheets and I'll use them for my smaller pieces. I'll just cut them down to um, smaller pieces of watercolor paper and use them for smaller pieces of artwork. Okay, now I, 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 I eyeballed that, and it, this is actually kind of, a, that's a little bit off there. Um, this is kind of a good practice for yourself um, when you're doing things. If you want to go back in and check, yep, that looks about, it's um, one centimeter, or ten centimeters, sorry, it's ten centimeters, basically about a half, a little bit less than a half inch. I'm looking when I when I ruled this off, I was making a square here, 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 and here. And that way I'm learning to basically I train my eye to judge distances as well as so so that makes me see what's here, here, and here. And then I'll go back in and check afterwards if I want to. But I've gotten to the point where I'm pretty good at guessing. Um, distances from the outside by just setting up a square in each of these places. Um, and then you get approximately a half inch. Okay, now what we're going to do, actually I'm not starting out with the ink, I've got to start with my drawing first here. Okay, what we're going to do, this is a um, lead holder. You can get these at different um, companies, make them, Mars Stradler, what have you. I like using lead holders because you get a very sharp point on the tip. I use a number 2B lead. Um, that might be a little bit soft for some people. I use this as a, a Statler point sharpener. And you sharpen your points by going round and round and round and round. I blow it off. Um, you can s stick it in. There's usually a cotton piece here. You can buy those separate too. Um, but you can see it gets a very, I don't know, a, a very sharp point on that pencil. Okay. Now we're going to, I have a photograph of a uh, Pygmy Slow Aloris off camera. Uh, so I'm using that as my reference material for this. I can't show the photograph because... Uh, that, that has a problem with copyright infringement. So what I'm doing is um, this particular picture has the Loris um, with his feet off camera. But I've got other pictures of Loris's with their feet on camera so I can get an approximation of 
what it would look like with its legs. And what I'm doing right now is I'm greeking in, basically getting a rough outline of the animal so I can feel, feel where I want it in the space. So, so I'm, you can tell it's really scattered and sketchy. Okay, now I'm gonna do it from an anat between, I'm thinking of anatomy and placement. So I'm looking at the photograph for approximate shape and placement of the different parts of the animal. Because it's just like with eyes, you know they're going to be bilaterally symmetrical. So they're going to be one on either side and they're going to be approximately same distance from this side and this side and this here and here. And then come down the nose is another like circular shape and it's got comma nostrils like that comes in around I'm gonna have him he's eating something so we can see him with his paw here and I'm thinking about this is the arm Aloris is a primate so it has similar body parts to a human. So you can think about a human body when you're thinking about the loris's body while you're looking at the photograph. So like this is the arm, this is the forearm, this is the hand. And you think in terms of how is that attached to the body. It's got a shoulder. It's shoulder. You can see on the photograph itself, and I know you can't see it, but I'm looking at the photograph. Its shoulder is about here. Its back's here, it has a stomach right there, and its legs are bent underneath it. And with the loris, it'll be. Mm, that's not going to be right. Okay, I gotta start from the beginning. I really screwed up. So I'm erasing the whole thing because I got the proportions off. I'm using a kneaded eraser. It's a, a latex eraser made out a latex eraser. It's made out of rubber. See, I made the loris. Its legs should be longer. And because I don't have that actual photograph of its the rear of its body, its legs are actually quite a bit longer. And it should be here. And I can adjust. One of the advantages of having drawn for as long as I have and knowing anatomy is that I can imagine seeing the loris in its in several photographs. I can figure out how its legs would be adjusted for the pose that I want. Put it in some trees. Okay. Now that looks like a complete mess. And that's basically the way most of my drawings start. They look like a complete mess, which is why I'm kind of feeling with my eyes where I want to put everything. And I'm trying to balance out. We've got a straight down this way and a diagonal up that way. So we've got, in the composition, I'm going to make, because he's got, he's hanging from his feet, and he's eating something down here. Now with all that scribble, I'm going to take the knead eraser and I'm ghosting it back. This is what I call ghosting back. And the reason why I say it, call it ghosting back is because you can still see the drawing underneath, even when you erase something down to the bare bones especially when you've got um, a cotton fiber paper, there'll still be some graphite left behind there so you can see where you started what you were doing. But it gives you, okay, I got a rough sense of where I'm going to be placing everything now. Okay. So now I'm going back to my photograph. And Dolores has got little 
I want to start actually with the bottom this time so I get the legs more right. And they're very, very fuzzy. They're very fuzzy animals. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to use them for the pen and ink demonstration because this will, I will be using um, a lot of cross hatching and stippling techniques to, to give me the, uh, the uh, type of texture I want in its fur. So again, I'm still keeping it loose. This is like, this is the second drawing. I usually, when you're, you're drawing for illustration, when you're drawing this kind of drawing, or you're drawing something that, that needs um, reference, um, technically, you end up drawing the same drawing about five times. Let's see here. You gotta see how it's shoulder, because he's, he's, got, he's got his arms tucked up here. Shoulders there, heads down here, hands up here. Okay, still getting adjusting so that so it makes sense. Because like I said, I don't have the, the photograph that I'm using as reference. Cuts him off about at his hips. He's cut off about here. So it's like here's butt is like right about here, and then his back comes in, and the back and the stomach are parallel, like a like a bean. But I'm trying, I'm comparing this side to this side to give it proportional correctness. And his shoulder comes in. This is his shoulder blade here. His neck comes over the top, and his other. Four, or his um, arm comes in there, and they've, the forearm is about one and a half times the uh, arm on this guy. And he looks like he's got a thumb, he's got an opposing thumb, and he's got four fingers, like we do. Which is probably one of the reasons why a lot of primates are um, very attractive to humans. Now, mind you, uh, a lot of animals have that five-digit setup with uh, even your dog. Your dog and your cat have a five-digit setup. Um, your dog usually has a dew claw. A lot of times they'll cut it off, but they'll have four to toes and a dew claw. Your cat has the same thing. And the thing is, is that actually our next closest relatives to the monkeys are um, rats, rats and mice. This is why when they, um, when we do biological experimenting, besides the fact that rats have very short lifespans, uh, it uh, they are very similar in biology to us. So that you know, if it's poisonous to a rat, it's poisonous to us. Um, I'm not sure they can eat chocolate. I know that, that we've got a problem with um, dogs and cats that they cannot consume chocolate. And I'm just thinking, I wonder if rats can consume chocolate. <laughs> I know, it's an odd thing to think about right now. But anyways, we're working on the feet. And Dolores has, again, these almost a human-like body here. But they've got longer. I keep on drawing that head too big. Gotta draw the head smaller. Draw the head smaller. So I was trying to debate for this particular video whether I should do the drawing before I started the video so it could be more on the inking side of things. And I thought, no, I'll do I'll do the uh, the drawing to show you the me doing sketching, but. Uh, because this was going to be an easy one. It's like, eh, I'm getting the proportions a bit off today. Everybody has their good and bad days. And right now, there we go, that's better. Like I said, I'm using reference material on the side here, and I'm judging portions of its body so I don't have the whole thing. Now, mind you, when I start the ink work on this, I'm going to keep my drawing actually pretty rough because I prefer to 
not have to redraw and redraw and redraw. I'm not having an art director look at this and give me an approval. So I don't have to do a really tight draw underdrawing for this particular piece. I just need to give myself my own reference. And once I give myself my own reference, then I can continue um, the finish of what I'm doing by just looking at the photograph and knowing where I want to put things. And that, you know, I hate to say that comes with years of experience, but yeah, that comes with years of experience. Um, where you can do some of the drawing in your head, or you can figure out where you're going to fill in later. And what I'm doing right now, again, is more setting up, um, it, it's kind of like a framework. You're setting up a, like a, uh, like if you're making a building and you put the, the framing in before you put the walls on a house, that's kind of what I'm doing here. And I'm going to put, I'm going to put another branch this way behind him and Greek in some leaves. So I'm putting it, setting up a couple of diagonals this way. I'm setting up a diagonal this way and he's coming, the loris itself is coming straight down in the center. Okay. All right. For now, that's all I need. Now, again, I'm going to ghost back what I just did. So that the um, the ink flows better on top of it, and I can still you probably won't be able to see this um, very well in the video, but you can you can still see that there is the barest outline of what I, I've initially done there, and let's see here. Now with pen, the best thing to do is always draw the pen back from where you're drawing. You can't always do it this way, but to pull the pen down is the best way to get your strokes. And right now I'm, again, I'm kind of like doing a, an initial dot to dot. Now the Loris is, is very fuzzy, so I'm going to give him, I'm doing strokes that are almost like stippling. so that you feel a sense of fur. And he, the Loris has very, very short, soft fur. They live in a, um, and they also, on their toes, they have nails. They, they have very, very, they're primates again. So their toenails, they literally have like feet with toenails on them. So, their, their, their feet almost look like their hand feet. So I'm giving him little nails and those, the, the toes will be pink when they're painted because they've got fur on the tops of their toes, but they've got, you know, standard, um, skin on the bottoms of their feet. So they're literally, they are in the, um, primate family, so they're like monkeys. And you can see as I'm going along, I'm, there's an outline here. You can he see the outline underneath. And I'm doing really quick pen strokes to get that initial outline of the fur. Now, um, again, with these dip pens, they're, they've got a steel tip, so they do stroke better. I am going to have to turn the drawing to keep the flow of the ink again, so I'm stroking down. So it helps to turn the drawing so that you can continue to stroke in one direction. You can tr try to push the pen, but it 
um, doesn't really work as well. And sometimes it'll flick if you uh, don't uh, push the pen in the right direction. And right now I'm keeping the, um, the stippling a little bit separate because um, I'm going to go back in and fill, fill it out more as we go along. Okay. So I'm getting a, just an outline. Now here is, he's got an ear. So the ear is a U. It's a little U shape. and it's got little lines inside the ear. Okay, now around his face, again, real bear-like. We come down to his muzzle. Uh, give that some space and go around the other side. And what I'm doing too is when I'm looking at this, again, it's a bi bilaterally symmetrical I don't know you love those wonderful words. Um, but this, it which means if you divide the face down the center, this side is kind of the same as this side. So you, if this is also a kind of a great practice when you're um, doing it, find a design and take it and try to draw the opposite side of it, like in a mirror, do a mirror image sometime, you know, take, take a, a photograph and fold it in half of anything and draw the mirror side of it. And what it does, it's an exercise that makes your brain think upside down and backwards. And that's a great way to, for you to um, work on your visualization skills. I, I do it all the time. Another thing that somebody um, suggested, I wish I could remember the name of the artist that suggested it that I started doing all the time, it's really good for practice too, is um, if you're bored, if you're somewhere you're stuck and you don't have your cell phone, geez, does anybody not have their cell phone nowadays? Um, but if you have some place where you don't have your cell phone, you don't have a sketch pad, you, you're, you're waiting for something to happen, look at the landscape around you and imagine yourself drawing that. Imagine like you have a pad and picture yourself drawing um, wherever you are. And you, you actually can get drawing practice without even having to draw anything because you're drawing it in your head. And I've done that sometimes. It's great for if you like, um, when I'm in a gas station and I'm waiting for the, the stupid uh, um, tank to fill up and I'll look at, okay, how are the pumps situated? Um, there are pumps over there. They're on an island. Um, uh, what what uh, things do you look at to see to draw that particular type of situation. Okay, so the Loris has got these little nostrils. Drawing the nose right now. And again, you can tell I'm more or less, I'm mapping things. When I go in here and like right now, I'm trying to get a feel for where I want to put the eyes. And he's got these nice little arc moon type shapes around his eyes. So I'm getting a feel for where I want to put those. And then he's got the, it arcs above his eye as well. Because I want to get the, the, this color. This is all going to be painted after I draw it too. So the next video I'll have is the painting of this particular piece. So it's like you want to, now I'm putting in the eyes. And one of the biggest problems too with the pen and ink is your pressure on the pen will determine the delivery of the ink, the amount of ink that you're drawing with to the paper. So if you press too hard, 
you're going to get a whole lot of ink. If you press too little, you're not going to get enough ink. And you learn over time how much ink will create that situation. And it doesn't take long. Um, there are some exercises you can do to uh, determine that with any pen. Like just doing some practice cross hatching is always a good thing to do. Okay, he's got a little color on his nose. The thing is that this area is white, but it's also, it comes down to his nostril area is black. So he's got a little black nose, but the rest of him is brown. It was when I was looking up the endangered species to do this week, and I thought, okay, um, I've done a variety of things with that. And they had a list. I just looked up online and said, okay, what, what, what is con currently considered endangered? And uh, the loris, they had loris on one of the lists. And I'm going, loris, slow loris. I don't think the slow loris is endangered. I think it's threatened, but I don't think it's endangered. And what it is, is as usual, they put slow loris down and it's like, uh, no, it's not the slow loris that's endangered. It's the pygmy slow loris that's endangered. And the pygmy lo slow loris is endangered because it lives in the forests of Southeast Asia. And uh, because of deforestation, um, and uh, uh, encroachment of an, on its environment. Um, that's its main reason for, and hunting, over hunting is always a problem with just about all our animal populations. Because you, you can imagine, the, it's like the, the loris is not gonna be a competitor with humans for food but it is gonna be a competitor with humans for the fact that it lives in the trees. And when we have farms, we don't want trees. We want flat land, so we deforest the land and subsequently a lot of animals lose out because they lose their home and their food supply. And that's what's happening to the slow loris. Okay, what I'm doing right now is a form of stippling. I, this is a random stippling pattern um, I'm just kind of bouncing with the pen. I'm not really being too picky about where it's going or what it's doing because the, the fur on the loris has a fluffy quality to it. And so I'm giving this random stippling to give it a bit of a fluffy quality. And I'm giving more of a stroke here because there's a shadow in this area on the fur. I want to give the feeling of a longer shadow there. And its tummy is, has kind of a ruffle to it. So it has a butterscotch color that comes down to about here. So I'm doing it rough there. And then its tummy has a little bit of a rough fur. So I'm giving it a little bit longer stroke. And it's got the, the butterscotch color on its head is it's a little bit darker here. There's a dividing line there. So what I'm doing here is I'm setting up the barrier for the color. And then where the color is going to be darker, you can see I'm keeping the dots in here a little wider apart. And then closer together. So wherever there's a line, you put the, the dots closer together. And where I'm giving just a value, I get the dots a little bit farther apart. And I'm going to thicken up this initial line that I put around the outside. Because now that I've set up the boundary, I'm going to try to give it some volume. And 
And the slow loris is basically um, four colors. I mean, he when I paint him, I'll probably have to use at least four colors. A lot of times what I like to try to do, especially for these videos, and actually for this is um, I like to use a limited palette if I can. Uh, I, I don't like to use a very large variety of colors. So when I come back in to clean this kit up and give him some color, him, okay, it, as I think for a moment, I was going, is this a he or a she? Um, Loris's testicles are a little bit harder to see because they're all covered in fur, so. In this particular pose, I don't think you'd be able to see the Loris's. He made his bum a little bit big. That's okay. This is art. We have, we have a little bit of leeway for artist license. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. And again, I'm I'm heavying up his little outline here a bit, and then I'm going back in. And again, with, with the stippling on this and being, like I said, very, very random, it's not so much dot stippling. You can see they're like little commas. So the little dotting, a little comma. And I'm varying the, the uh, direction that I'm hitting the stipple. And as I go away from the outside, the dots are wider apart, and as I want to get the volume darker, I put the dots closer together, and more of them, and that's how you get the value. The value it'll start turning the form. So on his leg here, okay, I want to give him a little volume to the leg. So you start by you know, where's the boundary of where I want that shadow or the the feeling of the, the turn to go. And then it, as I get closer to the edge, I'll just add more dots. And then this side. Again, you can see I'm turning the paper while I'm doing this to keep getting that stroke at least to go to the side or down. Also, you have to worry about the ink drawing. Um, I don't have a, I really should have a piece of paper under my hand. Let me do that right now. But even when you're doing with ink, um, <laughs> the, the, the main thing you don't want to do is stick your hand. Okay, this area is still wet. So I do not want to be putting my hand on the paper where I've got wet ink. So what you always have to, a lot of times drawing, you can draw all over the design and you don't have to worry about where you're putting your hand. Well, because this is India ink and it takes, it does dry very quickly. There's no two ways about it, that India ink will take only, you know, sometimes 30 seconds to uh, dry, depending on how much ink you've laid down. It evaporates very rapidly because it has varnish. So um, it does dry fast, but I can promise you there are so many times that I have just stuck my hand right in the place that I just finished inking and smeared the thing. And that's very frustrating. Uh, when that happens, if you're going to be doing a painting over it, um, what you want to do is use an X-Acto knife blade and scrape it away. Scrape the ink away, use your kneaded eraser to pull it out and then go over it with a latex eraser. And do that process a few times to get the, uh, the ink all out and get the, uh, I put to that to the side just because I want you to be able to see what I'm doing. And again, on this arm, 
I'm trying to, to separate the arm from the body, so I'm doing some really fast cross hatching, little stippling cross hatches there. And then I'm going to pull this out. Again, this I'm setting up the boundary for where the volume's going to go. And I'm just turning it by put, putting more dots near the edge. And as it goes towards the outside of the form, fewer dots. Okay. Turn them all around, see what I'm doing here. Okay, we're just about done with the loris. I want to, his shoulder, there's a um, little bit of fur division here in his shoulder. Okay, now I'm going to work on the background. Okay, so we're going to put in branch here. And again, because I didn't fully flesh out what I was doing with the branch beforehand, I'm making my gestures rather loose, but with branches and leaves, you can actually, oh, see that's, see what happened when I pushed that? I got a little bit of a splatter. And I might clean that up later or I might draw over it so that you can't see it, but I'll probably have to clean it up. There we go, maybe not. But that's what happens when you push your pen instead of pull your pen, you'll, you will get splatters like that. Okay. So right now I'm keeping things relatively loose. And I will come back over the lines after I do them loosely, if they're not quite what I want. Because I'm sometimes not brave enough you know, I'm to do just a full, you know, ink line straight through. I'm, I have a tendency to do sketchy lines and then come back and clean them up. And it, that's because of lack of courage. It's like. I don't know if I want to definitely put that line down here, so I'm going to sketch it in and, okay, now I've made a decision. So it's there, so it's down. And you'd think after as many years as I've been drawing, I'd get to a point where I'm not concerned about screwing up. I tell you, I'm always concerned about screwing up. Low self-esteem sucks. You know, it's, I'm, I'm the type of person who I have a bravado personality that I act very brave, but in fact, I'm, I, uh, I put on the act so that I figure if, if I act, um, courageous, I'll be courageous. You know, it doesn't always work that way, but that's why it's a lot of people, including my spouse, you know, look at me and they're like, Lynn, you can get through anything. It's like, yeah, I just act that way. That's not really me. That's, that's, that's the, uh, the, uh, other Lynn talking and the one that I'm trying to be rather than the one that I am. Okay. And see, so, so you can see now it's like th these lines are pretty loose here, but what I've really done is I've, I've just done a setup for, I'm going to come back over them as soon as they dry, and then I'm going to put one more branch this way. And what I'm doing here too is there, those lines that I drew on the side earlier, they're my boundary lines for the design of this, because I'm keeping this within a rectangle. Now I'm going to go back, now that, I, that I've drawn those, those leaf lines, I'm going to go back, I'm going to firm up 
this part of the drawing. Now you can see like right there, I one thing I do not want to do is put my hand in that puddle. I accidentally left a little bit more ink than I wanted to there. If I put a hand in there right now, I'm in big trouble. Okay, now I'm, I'm doing parallel lines along the branch here to make it look like bark. And this is the this this parallel line kind of bark is often you'll you'll see a lot of it in a variety of plants. So the allusion to something you might know as a plant that's barky, well, it'll have that feeling for it. See, now everything looks, you know, it's starting to look cleaner. A lot of times when I'm, I'm doing my drawings, I'll go over the drawing two or three times and it's kind of like if you've ever done any woodworking, it's like taking sandpaper to a rough piece of wood and sanding it down and getting it finer and finer and finer and finer. That's kind of the way I work with my drawings. Is that I will continually polish and polish and polish and you don't see my, my shaky hand or my shaky lines because I keep polishing the drawing. And I'm highly envious of those who can, you know, put down the line and it's there. I rarely have that kind of bravery. And then some people are just more precise than others. I mean, some people just can... I, I envy the inking that I see in Japanese manga. Oh my lord. They have, especially if you, you look at some of the um, the hair they do. They do these beautiful, beautiful straight lines. Very, you can tell somebody has been working with pen forever and knows how to put down that line just to the right stroke. And me, I like I said, I'm sketchy. That's the way I draw. But it also comes out for that's that's why I do more stippling, that's why I do more cross hatching. Um, that's why I do more pattern. And the thing is is too, um, the eye likes pattern. Or at least I find the eye likes pattern. I've been since I was a little kid, I love I've always loved things with detail in them. So it's a combination of my own trepidation when it comes to drawing and the fact that I do like pattern and design. And the more pattern you put in things, the more line, the more detail, the more interest a piece has, personally, I think. But then again, there, there are also simple works that look absolutely fine without detail. I mean, it's just a matter of taste more than anything else. And I have always loved linear things, so. Okay. We're just about done with this. And um, if I forgot to tell you, no, I think I did, but um, this pygmy slow loris is um, Southeast Asia, primarily Vietnam, China, parts of China. Um, supposedly there are only 500 in the wild. I've got to look up the, the numbers again. I'll definitely post um, the Wikipedia page for the pygmy slow loris at the um, along with this video. So if you want to look up the details on the animal itself, you can find things there. We don't have the, of all, all the um, old world, 
primates, we, Madagascar, um, Southeast Asia, um, Africa, have a lot of the more primitive primates. The New World doesn't have any of the very primitive primates. That's another reason why, you know, the, the land bridge and what have you, um, when the monkeys came over here, they were already more advanced. So the more primitive of the primates um, didn't get over here. Our monkeys are... Um, also, if you didn't know, New World monkeys have prehensile tails. Old World monkeys do not. So if you see a monkey in the zoo and it's clinging on to something with a tail, you've got a New World monkey. And a new, the new, by New World monkey, I mean um, Central and South America is usually where they come from or where they live. And we don't have any monkeys um, above Mexico because there's the Sonora Desert. And I don't think any monkeys could have gotten across that. I don't know if they've got any prehistoric monkeys. I know we have like, uh, um, we have the giant sloth, you know, it's La Brea Tar Pits here in California, um, had giant sloths. I think they did. Actually, I said that and then I'm going, I know they have dire wolves, mastodons. Yeah. Okay. Now, let that sit for just a moment. I'm going to show you, let's see here, uh, my apologies, ah, there it is, looking for my exacto knife leg. Um, okay, I had this, this problem up here in the corner. I'm going to take my knife, I'm going to slightly graze the surface with it and cut it, and then I'm going to take it, the tip of the blade, and I'm scraping it. And you're sanding down, I'm sanding down the pa surface of the paper with the knife blade. And then I'm going to take the kneaded eraser and just go over that. Take the latex eraser, go over that. And then the kneaded eraser again. And you can't really see any problems there. The, the, um, the, uh, ink splotch has gone away. Same thing I'm going to get. There's a dip there. I'm just going to take that away. So it's, it's like it acts like a racer, but you're, you're, you're scraping it down to the fiber. This, the kneaded eraser takes the, the next set, set of fibers away. And then the latex eraser cleans it all up. And that's what I'm going to do with We've got one little bit of ink that's drying right here. And I'm going to basically show you I'm erasing the last of the underdrawing first with the kneaded eraser. And I'm just going to do the top part because all the ink up here is dry. And I don't want to touch the ink at that. That one bit of ink at the bottom is not dry yet. And then I'm going to go over it with the latex eraser to clean that all up. And then um, normally you could do, brush it away or dump it into the garbage. Then I'm going to go over it with the kneaded eraser again. And you can keep going back and forth and back and forth like that until the piece is totally clean of graphite. You won't be able to see any of your leftover graphite after that. And I'll be ready for painting. Okay? So that is our Pygmy Slolorus. And uh, hope you enjoyed the tutorial. I really appreciate your being here. My name is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. Check out my Patreon. Uh, check me out on Instagram at L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. Um, I appreciate you stopping by. Have a great day.